This Rise and Shine podcast series has been made possible by the generosity of the Zeitelman Family Foundation, which is committed to the unity and continuity of the Jewish people through meaningful and relevant Jewish education and wisdom. We live in a time where true conversation has lapsed, where opinions are binary and without any nuance, that there's a right way to think and a wrong way to think, and this creates what we call Sinat Chinam, Baseless Hatred. This is Rise and Shine, a podcast that offers timeless wisdom and uplifting meditations to fill your heart, feed your soul, and start your day on a positive note. Here is Adrian Gold Davis. It can't just be me. Have you ever found yourself thinking of the perfect deal-breaker example, the perfect point to say in an argument days after the conversation was resolved? Do you sometimes think of how you might just work it into a conversation later without appearing to be petty, or somehow as if you're re-raising something that would be best left alone? So the great actress, Marlena Dietrich, once said that once a woman has forgiven her man, she must not reheat his sins for breakfast. And yet, sometimes these leftovers occupy way too much space in our brains, and they turn rotten and gross in the back of the refrigerator of our minds. Sometimes we unconsciously, or even consciously, if we're honest, search for a way to work those examples into our relationships. Why do we so badly need to win? It's pretty clear that one can win the battle but lose the war when it comes to peace in our relationships. So why are we willing to lose the war just to win a particular battle? The Torah teaches us a powerful idea, so powerful that it's one of the 613 commandments or connectors to holiness that can be the ultimate recipe for peace. It's regarding the commandment to rebuke our fellow, but it contains many conditions and disclaimers we need to practice before we ever open our mouths. You see, we are commanded to rebuke our fellow, but we may not do a sin in the process. From our Torah, we read that someone who sees his friend who sinned or is walking in a bad path, it is a mitzvah to return him to good and to know that he's sinning in his evil ways. As it is written, you shall surely rebuke your friend. However, it then goes on to say that one who rebukes a friend must rebuke him privately and gently and must tell him that he's only rebuking him for his own good and to bring him to life in the world to come. But here's the rub. One may only rebuke if they think that their friend will listen. If you know that they won't listen, it is forbidden to rebuke someone. That same source goes on to say that if one sees a person sin unintentionally and knows that he won't heed rebuke, if the sin isn't explicit in the Torah, one shouldn't rebuke that person. Some say one should rebuke a person only if he's familiar with him. This comes from something called the Kitsur Shulchan Aruch, in English, the condensed version of the set table, which gives us our marching orders for how to live Jewish life properly. Kitzur Shulchan Aruch is the summary of the Shulchan Aruch of Rabbi Yosef Karo, and it was authored by Rabbi Shlomo Gansfried in 1864. Too often, when we criticize and rebuke under the auspices of good parenting, thinking that it's our responsibility to name and attempt to correct every single misstep our children make, we tell ourselves it's for their own good. It's my job, after all. And if we do it with our kids, well, we do it so much more with our spouses. If it's a mitzvah not to speak where we won't be heard, why do we think that repeating the same criticisms, beating that same horse over and over, is somehow going to change the behavior of the offending person in front of us? Judaism teaches us not to shirk our responsibilities to those we love insofar as keeping them from dangerous behavior, be it moral, ethical, physical, or spiritual, but often what we define as for their own good is really for 
our own good, because we need to get the rust out of our pipes, because we need to control, because we see those we love as a reflection of us, as our second coming, as it were, our mini-me's, and we want them to never behave in ways that might reflect poorly on us. It's a hard one to admit to oneself that that which bothers us is often more related to our own self-image than to the other person's well-being. It takes excruciating self-honesty to break down our trigger spots and to mine them for why we are truly bothered by them. In Proverbs, or Mishlei in Hebrew, we read that open rebuke is better than concealed love, and better is the anger or rebuke of a true friend than the kiss of an enemy. And while those statements are true, how often do we rebuke others in anger rather than out of love? Because of ego and lack of humility, rather than a true desire to see a person reach their fullest potential. You know, because I'm good with words, I can often win any debate or argument. And because I have a yen for control, I have often deluded myself into believing that what I want to say, what I need to say, must be said right now. And there are generally times where what needs to be said has to be said. But first, we must search thoroughly and fearlessly through our intentions and self-correct, because if the person at that moment, or even ever, cannot hear then we must not speak. We live in a time where true conversation has lapsed, where opinions are binary and without any nuance, that there's a right way to think and a wrong way to think. It gives us unconscious permission to lash out at any other point of view or even behavior, and this creates what we call sinat chinam, baseless hatred. As a mother of grown and flown boys, I often wish I'd been mature enough to have checked my intentions before inflicting damage over things that should have been left unsaid. As a wife of many, many years, I deeply regret the words of criticism that flew past my lips in my righteous indignation. But it's not too late for you to learn what life has taught me through years and experience. There are very few negative things that need to be pointed out if they will create distance between people. Again, in Proverbs or Mishle, it says, As in water, face answers to face, so is the heart of a man to a man. We simply cannot get through to anyone if our heart is not filled with love and our face tender and gentle and calm. This week, can you look at your relationship with rebuking and practice these disciplines laid out in the Shulchan Aruch? Can we learn to control our mouths with those gates that God provided us? You know what they are. Lips that shut, teeth that shut, and the tongue that stays still. Three gates to guard the danger that comes from any form of negative or dispiriting speech. One way to do this is find a friend who'll join you in this endeavor. Make a practice of noting in writing or on your phone all day long when you hold your tongue and review together in the evenings. Celebrate the control. You will find extraordinary pleasure in the mastery of this mitzvah. One of the men on the men's momentum trip said to me once, Adrian, if you don't take mastery over your mind... It will take mastery over you. And since our words come from our thoughts, let's work to be masters of ourselves. May we find our homes abundantly peaceful as a result of this discipline. Thanks for listening to Rise and Shine. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to Momentum Podcasts on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Join Adrian again next time for more timeless wisdom and uplifting meditations that fill your heart, feed your soul, and start your day on a positive note. 
This podcast was sponsored by the Zeitelman Family Foundation. Spread the wisdom. Inspire Jewish individuals around the globe by supporting Momentum's podcasts. To sponsor, contact podcast at MomentumUnlimited.org. You're listening to a Momentum podcast. For unlimited inspiration, wisdom, and empowerment, visit MomentumUnlimited.org.